Welcome to Jewish Boy Calls His Mother. I'm your host, Sadia, and this is my mother, Ima. Hey, Ima. Hello, my little sweetness. Mm, I miss you. I miss you, too. Yeah. Well, hopefully, we'll see you God willing Chalkah time, no? Yes, 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 yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll see you in Jersey yes. first. This is Hashem. No, I'm flying into Baltimore first. Oh, awesome. Yeah, Great. I'm flying into Baltimore, and then um, from... Baltimore, then we'll all drive up to, to Jersey and uh, take it from there. Mm. So uh, following up on our previous episode uh, about that Lebanese guy who claimed to be Jewish, uh, there uh-huh. was an interview I posted up on the, our Facebook group. Um, but it's interesting. He, he, he doesn't he's, he's really scared to admit that he's wrong. I feel like the reason why <laughs> is because if he did, he'd get you feel like he's going to get into a lot more trouble because I mean, the, technically speaking, if 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 he actually um, was with was with uh, his wife biblically, uh, without her knowledge of understanding who he really was, um, he can get into some trouble for that. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, you know something. It's there was an episode of Law and Order SVU. My favorite, one of my favorite, pro- my favorite program, actually. <laughs> it's not trash. It's just uh, trash TV. No, it's not. It's very interesting. The, the reason interesting people trash like it, TV. No, no, no. But I think the reason people <laughs> like that, that, by the way, that program right now is the most popular program on the air. And I think what it is, it's not your usual bang, bang, shoot them up detective program. It shows the entire process mm. of what the police have to go through in the investigation and working with the lawyers and getting the proper evidence. So it takes the whole thing from beginning to end. And there was a case of a woman who that's exactly what happened. She thought she was uh, having relations with a particular man who basically he, um, he was impersonating another man. Mm. And she thought that she was with this other man he was impersonating. And then when she found out that no, he was impersonating that person. And so therefore she wasn't having relations with the one, the man she thought he was. Therefore, it was technically rape because it was she was not giving her consent to him. She was giving his her consent to the guy that he was impersonating, who she thought he was. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like with this guy, he's he's gonna be he, he's uh, he's gonna be in a lot of trouble for a while. Well, so what's his explanation behind the whole thing? But but besides the fact that he had a, um, I think he had a, a fake passport or something. For no, it, he, was, he never what, had, never had a fake passport. He just lied about his name, but he kept his real, he kept his real uh, passport and his real uh, license, and it threw off every uh, his wife because she was just confused as to why he said his name was one thing, but his passport was another. So he claimed he worked for the NSA. In order to like cover up, it's honestly it sounded. And I was right from the start. It's it, uh-huh. it was a comedic like train wreck. This guy like basically went through, and he was just a poor schlub who literally was trying to like you know just just live a, a life with 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 people that wanted to you know be with him, and he was so scared of being rejected, he basically lied himself into you know this little pickle he got himself into, and. You know, I don't know what's going to happen now. I'll, I'll be curious to see in five years of follow up to see if anyone <laughs> like is going to convert him or well, is is he is he an American citizen or no? Uh, maybe he that or a green card. I don't know. Either way, he's he's definitely in uh-huh. America legally. That's for sure. Uh huh. Yeah. But mm-hmm. that's that's all we have for it. We want to talk about for the for for the guy. I just, <laughs> like we, I posted up the interview. Uh, I heard uh-huh. heard the interview. I heard his side of the story. And now I guess I'd like to see a follow up in about a, a year, year to five years. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to tell you about something I did for dinner tonight. I had run out of bread a couple of days ago. So I was going to you know, stop by Publix and uh, get some bread. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, I have a bag of flour in the house. It's been years since I've made biscuits. Why don't I just go make myself some biscuits? So um, I, tonight, well, a couple of night, last night, I made myself plain biscuits, just ordinary, you know, flour, salt, uh, baking powder, a little bit of olive oil mixed together, water, you know, and make yeah. your biscuits. Tonight, I decided to add raisins and cinnamon and 
oat. Well, I had an oatmeal a couple of days ago and I had the oatmeal. So it's oatmeal, cinnamon, raisins, and flour and water and baking powder and olive oil. Mm, and then, um, you know, um, the, we, I have a jar of this honey from Israel that it's honey and frankincense with vitamin D and zinc. Mm. And I poured it on the biscuits. Was it good? Yes, it was very, very good. Did you ever cook when you were a teenager? Um, not too often because my mother, my mother didn't encourage us to really cook and you know do too much in the kitchen. She kind of like chased us out, you might say. Oh. And so some some mothers are that way. Some mothers just don't want. Uh, some women are very possessive about their kitchens. There's an old saying: you can't uh, a kitchen. Two women cannot be in a kitchen. Uh, I, never that. I never heard that. Never heard that. When I when I was a kid. It was a saying that they that used to go that way. The two women cannot be in one kitchen. And that's the way my mother was. Her kitchen was her territory. The only thing my sisters and I did was we ran this little kitty camp. So for the oh, last yeah, you day mentioned of, that. Yeah. So for the last day of kitty camp, we wanted to bake a cake. So we decided to add green food coloring to it, make a green cake. Nice. <laughs> me, me, Auntie, Auntie Anne and I. And the lot of the kids wouldn't eat it. Oh, because it was green. It was, it was green. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's funny. Now, one time, Aunt Anne tried to make some sort of cake. Um, I, all I remember was it did not go well. Um, and all I and I said to her, it didn't. I forget it was undercooked. It didn't bake. It. I don't know what happened. It just got all messed up. And I said to her, you know what? Let's pour this into some glasses and add vodka to it and make a great drink. Oh, God. Well, when you were, what don't you miss about being a teenager? I don't miss the, the boy chasing and the broken hearts and the crushes. Mm. I do not miss that at all. I am so happy. I think I can talk. I think I can say for a lot of people that that's one thing I'm sure that they also do not miss about their teenage years. You know, crushes on boys getting you know and then the boy you know doesn't know you exist or doesn't care or going out with a guy and it's a great date and you really love him and this is the real thing and the next day he's not even looking at you and then you wonder well what did I do what did I say and then you find out that hey he's dating someone else or you see him with another girl that he's dating I mean you know that's that's kind of devastating for a teenager I think it's devastating for anybody. I think once, once someone starts dating, they, that really crushes them. Because I mean, like, I, I know that when I, I didn't really start dating until I was 18. Um, and I didn't really get seriously dating until I was maybe 21. Mm-hmm. And I did that whole saving, saving, like, you know, don't mm-hmm. worry about high school. Don't be a dumb teenager kind of situation. But I still felt the same exact emotions that, anybody felt if they were starting to date at 15 16 that i felt between 18 and 20 it's just it was just Mm -hmm. like i just got used to it and i felt that if i did it when i was younger i would get used to it quicker uh so i could build up a thicker skin because to Mm -hmm. be honest it was just like i was so love struck desperate kind of guy i wouldn't say i was desperate it was just it was just i Mm -hmm. i pined after love and attention that like the second girls started giving me attention one way or another, I started really just giving into it back. And I became, I guess, a little needy at first. And mm-hmm. I felt that maybe if I had an experience when I was younger, maybe if I did it when I was 15 or 16, I would kind of learn the lessons that I should have learned when I was younger that I kind of eventually learned when I was like in my mid twenties. I think you're, well, like you gave me, you hit a very good point. Rejection at any age can be can really be very hurtful it's not devastating but it also is an individualistic type thing it's like um as you get older if you're the type of person who um is able to face your challenges and overcome them and you know take on like take on life and succeed the more you succeed the more confidence you get and eventually you realize that i'm a very worthwhile capable individual and you come to the point as you get older that, hey, you know, I've proven myself. 
And if somebody doesn't want me, well, guess what? It's, uh, the feeling's quite mutual and um, there are other fish in the sea. But, it, you know, I think it takes, like I said, overcoming life's challenges. It takes like a certain maturation. I'm also don't miss the, um, how can I say it, the cattiness and the snobbishness that I had to put up with other teenage girls in my high school. And the interesting thing is that years later, when I ran into the same people who were such nasty, snobby teenagers, as adults, they were just the opposite. You would never guess this was the same person. So many of them that I ran into, with the exception of one, were so nice and so charitable and so sweet. And, you know, like I said, they uh, to- totally different. Yeah, you know, we, all, we all grew up. We all learned. We all grew up. You know, it's, it's and, the- I think, and, I think, and I think our environment, too, at the time, was much too competitive. What do you mean at the what do you mean at the time? What because everyone was a bunch of boys and girls together in the same space? It was a uh, boys and girls together in the same space. Um, girls did not real as going to a co-ed school. The girls really did not have the opportunity to really develop themselves as independent women because we were there was always the boy competition. Besides the fact that in those days, you're talking about the 1960s, there were still science clubs that were, you know, close to girls. There were still competitions at the time that were close to girls. Uh, girls were not encouraged to go into science and math. I mean, they did. I know, I know women of my age that went into science and math, you know, despite it, you know, and um, the numbers were growing at that time. The numbers were starting to grow, but it, it's not what it is today. Also, there was so much competition with um, if you if you weren't dating, if you did, if you didn't look good and you weren't dating, you were like a nobody. You just didn't go out. There was no such thing as just go just just palling around with friends. No, you had to have a date. You had to have a guy. You, You had to be you have to have you had to be on some guy's arm to be something and to go out and to be anything. It was also the grade competition. Our, the high school I went to was extremely competitive. Um, there was more emphasis on achieving. And Sorry, um, you're mute. Are you my, okay? phone, my phone came on. Yeah, right. no, my phone, I got, a, I, just, I got a call. I just uh, rejected this call. The, um, tell me, did you hear the last line I said? No, I didn't hear what you said the last line. I said that there was more emphasis on achieving than on being a decent human being. So that that's where I like I'm curious to know, at least from what I saw in an all being in an all boys school, but I guess with my sisters being in an all girls school, I think there wasn't that much self consciousness as it would be in a co ed school. You know, I remember speaking to some of my friends who went to Rambam, which was co-ed at the time, and asking them, like, well, how is it when you're, like, in class learning and then all of a sudden there's a girl there? Like, do you get distracted? Do you not? And they admitted, like, yeah, you get distracted or you just try not to think about it or you eventually, you know, you get used to it. Um, mm-hmm. But for me, being an all-boys school, it was just, like, girls you, – you think with boys, like, girls are on this weird little pedestal you know, like in an all boys school, forget about it. It was just, you know, it, it's it, it's almost like a like a totally different, not just a different person, but a whole different being. It was just something like you were trying to wrap your head around and comprehend because you're like a just a dumb little teenage boy. Um, but so I we, did you did you find that being in an all boys school that um, uh, that you were able to concentrate more on your studies? I think so. I think mm-hmm. so. I mean, I there was some times I had some crushes that I had as a teenager and I was basically just, you know, I, I, I didn't really make anything of it because I kind of learned from you, learned from my parents, you know, just focus on school, don't focus on girls. So I didn't kind of make a big deal out of it. But I saw some of my friends who had girlfriends and whatnot, and I just saw how they were just distracted 
a lot. It took a lot of the energy, emotional, mental energy out of them when really they should have been focused on, on their studies. And I thought of yeah. also, like, at least for an all girls school, I think that they're not too worried about boys, you know, being a distraction that they're able to focus on their studies that, you know, they they'd probably have a better shot at like STEM and things like that. I think I remember speaking to some girls who went to all girls schools and asking them, like, how was it focusing on your studies and whatnot? And they said, like, because there wasn't any boys and because they all had like the same uniform, you know, you couldn't really do this competition situation. And this this thing that you were you were explaining when you went to public school, they couldn't really do that as much because they had such strict rules of like no putting on makeup and wearing this these same baggy uniforms and not being allowed to talk to boys like basically you separate yourself from all these distractions and all these things you really just focused on the education and you can see that where the you know the girls go to like stern and yu and these other like big colleges and universities and they actually do a very good job of succeeding that way you you had something also you touched on the idea like uniforms i remember um one day just crying to my mother i said please send me someplace where there's uniforms because um, in those days, the public schools did not have uniforms. And we were the poor people of the neighborhood. So here I was going to this high school where you had these very, very rich kids from some of these neighborhoods that were coming in with the latest styles and everything. And here I was with my latest hand-me-downs. And needless to say, oh boy, yeah, I got, uh, you know, I got bullied, I got teased. And it was, you know, it was just miserable sometimes. So I think this idea, you know, like you said, of uniforms, I think it's really good. I think it takes a, I think it takes away from, like I said, the clothes, we used to call it the clothes competition, which, yeah. you know, an another distraction that's, you know, not necessary in your teenage years. Yeah, it's, it's, I think being a, being a teenager, it's just more of like, you're trying to become your own person away from your childhood and away from your parents but it's so mm -hmm. funny is that no, no matter how hard you try to not be like your parents you wind up being your parents like you develop <laughs> the same habits and things like that like uh, what what would you say would be like a good habit or a bad habit you learned from your parents that you like still have or you're working against okay well, my my background you know east european background and the because the jews from that, were so downtrodden and so beaten down. A lot of them had the, this very fatalistic view on life. I remember my mother always saying, whenever there was a problem, well, she would say, what's gonna be is gonna be and you can't change it. You know, like, um, like if she would lose something, yes, that's, like, that's my schlamazel, that's me. Nothing good ever comes my way. Or uh, something nice that she had would break or tear. Yes, I'm not. I I can't have anything nice in this life. Ugh. And it drove me and my sisters crazy to the point that finally, I when she started this, what's going to be is going to be. You can't change it. I finally said, Oh yes, you can. <laughs> we just, <laughs> you know, being raised in America, the Americans are raised with this idea of yes, you can change things. Yeah. It's a very American idea. And I was talking to a woman who was married, who was married to a man from Iran. And she said, that's one of the biggest fights she and her husband got into was she being an American was one of these people of, yes, we can fight this. Yes, we can change this. And he was, no, you can't. What's going to be is going to be. It's just our muzzle. And she would yell at him. No, it's not. You can't change things. I'll stop this. Yeah. But like, honestly, I, I've, I've heard stories of, people escaping Iran through Turkey and having to live off a toothpaste for a week. So I can imagine they're a little bit, actually, no, <laughs> you should be more positive when you go through, go through things like that. When mm -hmm. you realize you could have, you, you got out of situations like that. You could have really, you really can be something that's, Oh, that's a little interesting point that like, you should really technically be more positive if you go through some kind of struggle and you're able to succeed from that struggle. Yes. You, I was thinking of that too. And I think back as you were talking, well, I mean, I think like, my God, my grandparents as teenagers, they were like in their late teens, left their countries, came to the United States, started a new life. You know, they were like pioneers and to come to a, a different culture, a different language and to get a job and to learn the language and to raise a family. I mean, you're right. 
they did overcome a lot of challenges, you would think that they would be a, a lot more positive about their lives because they did overcome these things. I don't know, maybe there was also something too that I think maybe they didn't want to be too positive because they were afraid of being disappointed. So if well, you go around depressed all the time, not expecting too much, you won't be disappointed. For, well, for me, it's more of like, I don't want to be satisfied. You know, once you're satisfied, that's when you kind of start like plateauing or going down. Like it's not uh, a constant. So if you're constantly working on yourself saying, I need to do better, I need to do better. Like it's in a mm-hmm. way, it's a good motivator, so to speak. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, pe- people, well, people in general, it's human nature that we, as human beings, we're not stagnant. We're yeah. always looking to, we're going one way or the other. Like say in Yiddishkeit, they say, in Yiddishkeit, everyone's going one way or the other. You're either going down in your Yiddishkeit or you're going up in your Yiddishkeit. One, you know. And same thing is true with like achievements in life. You know, you always think of um, like your schedule, like how, how could I have done better? How can I do better today? Like how can I accomplish more today that I didn't do yesterday? Was it I uh, watched too much uh, Law & Order SVU uh, <laughs> instead of, instead of uh, doing something more creative or taking care of some uh, clerical things <laughs> like uh, that I need to take care of? Uh, yeah. Which is why I got to, which is why I got to bed in one, one, one o'clock in the morning when I should have been in bed at 10. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I sleep, I, I, I stay up till 10 30 at night and I'm like, Oh my God, I'm, oh my, I'm it's too much. I got to go to sleep now. Jeez Louise. Uh, okay. But you were, you were talking about what were you talking about? There was also a couple of things, other things that um you mentioned. We wanted to we, we, talk we, about. We, we, we wanted about, to talk oh, about a few yeah. other things, but we're, we're kind of running out of time oh. though. Oh, but there's one more thing I want to mention. I had an interesting conversation. And usually I don't mention people's names, but I have to mention this name. Your brother Menachem came up with su- such an interesting idea. I said to him, you ought to write this up in a treatise and send it to some sort of like psychology magazine or you know, human interest magazine. He had an idea that years ago, people looked at marriage as, and family you know, raising kids and marriage as a function. Whereas today we look at marriage and raising children uh, from a pleasure point of view. Interesting. Rather than from a functional point of view. Interesting, interesting, interesting. That's a very good point. Let's 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 work on that maybe next week. Let me make a note of it. Maybe we can even have Menachem as a guest speaker. Uh no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just me and you, Ima. Me and you. Okay. okay. Uh, so family <laughs> as function. <laughs> Whereas today we're looking at as pleasure. Well, I remember when I was raising your, your kids, I, I loved playing with you kids, especially as babies, you know, bouncing you around, singing songs, you know, clapping, your, you know, taking your little hands and clap, teaching you how to clap your hands and bounce and I, I found it like so much fun. And as a matter of fact, I came under a lot of criticism from um, my you know, from my parents and my in-laws, which were of a different generation, saying, why am I playing with my children so much? Why do I hold them so much? Wow. Jeez Louise, <laughs> that's some real rough old school you stuff. Got, you're going to spoil them. <laughs> and I would say to them, you can never spoil a child with too much love. All right. Sounds like a good plan. Um, all right. I love you, Ma. Love you, honey. Have a wonderful night. Have a wonderful uh, weekend. Have a good Shabbos. Good. You have a good Shabbos, sweetheart. Mm-hmm. Thank you for listening to Jewish Boy Calls His Mother episode. Please like and subscribe our Facebook group at Jewish Boy Calls His Mother podcast and check out our YouTube channel, Jewish Boy Calls His Mother. I know you'd like it, and my mother would appreciate it too.